episode 107. This is the business of architecture. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where each week I speak with a successful architect, designer, or consultant to discuss tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Today's episode is the second half of a presentation on marketing for architects that Eric Bobro and I gave in Hamilton, Ontario on May 7th, 2015. In this half, we talk about automating the follow-up process with your contacts and how you can help projects move ahead by offering something we call the low commitment consultation. With that, here's today's show. All right, so so what what we're what we're advocating here and what we're encouraging everyone to think about is to uh, to market your expertise and your educational information instead of marketing your services. So what that's going to do for you, it's going to give you a much much broader group of people who are going to want to start opening that communication with you, as opposed to just people who are looking for a project right now. So if you've thought about the um, that image that Eric showed of the broadcast studio design example we gave you. Uh, so just to give you some backstory there, we help the client develop that. Then what he does is we have a we develop a communication plan over the next 12 months, where we then send that out to contacts. So they're getting information that's going to help them if they're considering doing a broadcast studio, and that's how that that process begins. So Mona, she's in uh, New Zealand. What she found is after she stopped just marketing her, her services and she started marketing education that she was getting so many leads, she was spending all of her time sending out her follow-up information. So we said, okay, how can we automate this process? How can we make this easier to do? Can we, can we automate this process? The answer is yes. So some of you may have seen this before uh, on through the web, like an internet. We call this a landing page. So very simply, it's a web page that has, now most all of you probably, if you have a, a website, you probably already have a contact form on there somewhere, right? You probably already have, you know, you know, please put your email address, please put your name, please put, you know, why do you want to talk to us, submit. So all we're saying is just let's just modify that form a little bit and let's give them something for submitting their name, right? So just instead of just depending on them to take the initiative, we're actually taking the leadership role and we're saying, you know what? I would love to be in contact with you, and by the way, here's something that I'm going to give you to help you, you know, reach out to me. We're, like Eric said, helping more people. So this would be what we call the landing page. Now, it has a very simple formula to create this. There's usually a headline that talks about the benefit the person's going to get from submit when they submit their information. There's the opt-in form, which is basically the contact form. Uh, we like to put an image of the offer, the image of the report, whatever it is, makes it more tangible. And then I always like to have, people like to see faces. So even if you're in a big firm, people really, we're doing business human to human. It's about the human relationship. People, they're not doing business with the firm. They're doing business with you. And so a picture of a smiling person there actually does wonders to help people feel like it's not just a blank entity. And so that down there we have, this is architect Dion Simonara down from uh, Brisbane on the right there. So the question is, where do you drop the bait? So we call this the bait, right? So you have your fishing pools, you have your, or your, your areas where your fish congregate. You've identified where your targets are, where the people are who you want to form new relationships with. And then you have your bait. So your bait is your educational offer. Where can you drop the bait? Well, in the case of uh, one client, we would just send that out directly to people. And on another hand, you could use in your site, signage, your own newsletter. Uh, Google AdWords for residential architects can work. Uh, newsletters, whether it's a school newsletter, an industry publication. For instance, if you had done that, um, that ad in an industry publication with an educational offer, I bet you would have gotten a much higher response. Um, Low-cost advertising. So game changer number three is the lead generator landing page, which is just basically you know, just modifying that contact form on your web page and making it something a little bit more interactive. Any questions about the, the landing page? 
So this is how we begin to automate the process and the automation happens once someone submits their name instead of just sending an email to you it actually goes into a database and there's some automated things that start happening behind the scenes. So it takes a little bit of setup but once it's done that's what's going to save you not turn you into a mailing house. Is, uh, is anyone doing that right now? Any of you have an offer on your website that offers a report or some useful information? Okay, so information about how to get a permit or how to the process of getting a building permit. Excellent. Very, very interesting because you're not saying buy my services. You're saying we have some information. So the Chamber of Commerce, think about connectors, people who are in front of the same people or companies that you'd like to be in front of. They're, whether they're contractors, sometimes speaking to clients before you are, real estate agents, uh, chambers of commerce, business development companies, or you know, uh, hospital associations for you know, hospital administrators, things like that. Who can you provide information to that they can then share with their members? So there's another person who raised their hand back there. Yeah. Sheena, you had something? So uh -huh. educating the building owners about the upcoming energy regulations and changes. Right. So, uh, so you're no longer saying hire us. I mean, of course, you want to be hired, but you're saying here's what you need to know about energy. So you're talking about something that is already on their mind. Perhaps they're aware that they need to make changes or they just have an interest in saying, I'd like to use less energy. So you're now becoming an expert in their eyes. I mean, you are an expert, but you're establishing that. Awesome. Okay. So uh, the title of this presentation, once again, was How to Become an In-Demand Architect. Well, that's exactly what happened to Mona Quinn when she implemented this strategy, that now she's actually known as the, um, the character home specialist in all of New Zealand. She's been invited to Australia to speak on the topic. She's been invited to join a, a commission there and sit on the board in, in New Zealand, and it's been a huge game changer for her practice. So game changer number three is to have this lead generator landing page. Any web development firm is going to know how to set this up for you. So all this stuff here, it's not that di difficult. Any web developer could do this kind of work. Um, I'm going to give you an example here from architect Joel Rosa, who's uh, a member of our marketing academy, where we do some training and sales training and teaching for uh, how to do this stuff. Uh, Joel is a residential architect based out of Portugal. And you can see when someone lands on his homepage on his website here, um, they basically see the opportunity to have this free download. So who is this going to attract, right? So there's also some qualification going on here because this is going to attract people who are looking for something very particular. In this case, someone who's thinking about building a custom home in Portugal. If you have any extra money, I recommend it. I hear it's rather nice. Mediterranean <laughs> year-round. Contact Joel. So you click on this. When you click on this little button here that says get the guide, you're taken to the landing page that has a headline talking about what the guide is. It has a little blurb saying what you're going to learn in this guide, what the client's going to learn. And then down here they can download that and get the guide. Now you can have this delivered. He has it delivered um, uh, electronically. It's actually better to deliver it physically if someone can get like a physical mailing. That way you can capture the, the mailing address. Any additional information you can capture is good. So after, after you click submit there, you're taken to this page, which says, you know, success, it's on the way. Now, there's a reason why we're not putting this guide right on the page. It's because we want them to go back to their email address. We're training them to understand that they're going to get good things from us in the inbox. So Joel's starting to open up the line of communication here where he's training them for the fact that he can then follow up in the future, right? and they're going to know that that's going to be coming to the inbox. So they go to the inbox, they find a link back to the web page, which let, allows them to download the free guide. Okay, so instant gratification. And then here's just an example of what that guide looks like. Uh, I think it's, I don't know how many pages, I think there's 10 or 12 pages talking about some of the different steps someone might need to consider. So think about it here. If someone's considering doing a home in Portugal, are they going to find this useful? They're going to eat this alive, right? Because it has all the things they're probably wondering. So that's the key when you're thinking about doing something like this is what are the questions that they have? There's another inside peek at it. So in terms of the automation, here's how this works. Because uh, I said like an automated email needs to go out. Someone lands on the landing page. They submit the form. It's going to get put into your automated database. There's going to be some automated follow-up. And then after that, they're going to be put into your monthly communication, so your monthly newsletter, whatever communication you have going on on a monthly basis. So let's review really quickly and see if there's any questions. We talked about the monkey's fist, talked about the landing page, 
talked about the automated email that goes out. I'm going to show that a little bit more, the database, and it's also important to have multiple lead sources. Any questions right now or comments? Okay, so the gentleman back there said it seems to be a very web-based strategy. Do you have any strategies that aren't web-based? And as a matter of fact, we do. That's a good question. So if you think back to the broadcast studio that we showed, who's putting out that document, that's a completely offline strategy. So that's a hard copy piece of uh, material that goes out to his clients. It's mailed through the post, and then he's going to follow up in a like manner through the postal system. So same strategies, it's just the way you implement a little different. Does that make sense? So you can use the same automated database. So in this case, instead of sending out an automated email, we actually recommend doing the email in conjunction with the offline. So what the, the automated system would do, and I'll show you this in a minute, is it basically can set up reminders, hey, you need to send out this packet to so-and-so. That could then go to a staff member, so they package that up and send that out. Does that make, is that clear? Is that all right? Let me add one more thing. So think about the broadcast studio. It's relatively easy for him to come up with a list of his target clients. If you're a hospital designer, it's relatively easy to come up with a list of the potential clients in your area that you'd want to contact. So mailing something physically to 10 or 100 or even several hundred um, uh, companies is practical. On the other hand, if you're a residential designer, you don't know where someone's going to come and say, I need a second story addition. You know, you don't know where. So that's why the web becomes useful because people will search for an architect or they'll search for, you know, second story addition ideas or they'll search for something that's related to their, uh, their need. So the web is one way to do it. The job site sign, that's physical proximity. They're driving past and they go, oh, you know, so now you, you're speaking to people in that geographic area. So some of us are much more geographical focused. So, Online is a way to do topic-based and interest-based things, but publications or just lists of your target audience that you actually send something out, not cold calling, saying, hey, I'd like to talk to you to tell you about our firm, but sending them something, or possibly even calling to say, we have a new report on this topic, latest improvements in operating rooms and uh, medical equipment technology. Can we send that to, to you? You know, if it's done in the right way, with the right type of offer, it won't be perceived as, oh, you know, this is a solicitation. It's just we wanted to share something useful. So that's offline. All right, so let's have a quick quiz here. The monkey's fist is, let's see who is awake this morning. I'm sure all of you are on top of it. Monkey's fist is A, a cooking utensil ideal for straining wet pasta. B, a peanut stealing device used on a construction site. C, a rude gesture. Or D, an educational offer that is high value to your target clients, uh, which typically generates 10 times more leads than traditional advertising, builds goodwill, and positions you as an expert. B? <laughs> I know. Who, who, can, who can say? The correct answer is D, that it, it does all, that th all the things we talked about. All right, so we're just going to move on here because we just talked about that, and we're going to move into... Uh, the systematic follow-up process. So the first part, we talked a little bit about the attraction, about how to bring people into your ecosphere, okay? And now we're going to talk about how to then, what we call, educate them. Thanks, Enoch. So how can you double or triple the number of meetings you get with qualified clients? Would that make a difference if you were able to get more meetings? Do you think you might be able to actually bring in more business? Well, there's a problem. If you do get a lot of people contacting you, that flood of calls will go down the drain if you don't have a system to get them to a meeting. Now, did you know that when people are thinking of hiring or a company is looking to hire another company for a service, you know, architectural design, that very, very rarely does someone call up or meet you at a party and say, you know, I've heard so much about your firm. Can you do our next project? I mean, that happens occasionally, but most of the time there's a call, there's a call back, there's a meeting, there's several contacts there, and in fact, 80% or more will close after five or more contacts. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that for any sales process, it's easy to stop after one or two or three contacts. So someone calls you, you answer the phone, they say that they're interested, say, when do you want to talk next? They say, oh, I don't know, maybe in a week or two. You call them and say, oh, we're too busy. You call them two weeks later, Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, we're, we're, it, it'll be a while. 
You don't get back to them. Why? You don't want to bug them. You know, you have too many other things. You forget about it. So the real problem is if you quit staying in touch after two, three, or four contacts, you're likely missing the opportunity when they say, you know what, we really need to get moving on this. Uh, see, what firm were we talking Oh, let's call so-and-so. Well, are they thinking of you? Have you been in touch with them in the last week or month so that they remember your firm? So only 14% of architects follow up three times or more on a systematic basis. So that's a big issue. You're leaving a lot of opportunities on the table, so to speak. So the number of touches is connected with trust. So what is a touch? Well, if we say hello, if later we bump into each other in the hallway, and later we sit down next to each other, you know, at, at the luncheon or something like that. You've seen me several times. You know, you start to feel like, oh, yeah, oh, that's that guy. Um, if you go to the cafe, you know, see someone a few times, you get to know them. Well, think about, have a few phone calls. You start to have a feeling um, of getting to know people. The number of times that you're in touch it builds up trust. Now, you need to have a systematic process. Otherwise, it's just too easy to quit because you either don't want to bug people or you're just busy. So. How do you build a relationship? If you think about whether it's any type of relationship, whether it's coming up with a business partner when Enoch and I connected uh, a long time ago, um, or you know maybe you're married, uh, you don't just meet someone, have one date, and say, I'd really love to get married to you and have kids. Now, maybe some of you had the inclination, like when I connected with Laima, that this is something really special, OK? But you don't say at the time. You know, it's just you need to build it up, right? OK. And what? Yeah, I didn't say it. Um, so you need to go step by step. Um, so how do you do that? Going instead of just having a meeting and saying, this was great. We'd love to work on your project. You're the ideal type of client for us, and we know we can help you. Here, I'll send you a proposal next week. Well, it, sometimes it works. But more often, it'll work better if you follow up. So here's the automated follow-up idea. What well, we talked about, just sending information like the monkey's fist, the educational report. Well, if you're in touch with people on a regular basis, a newsletter <clears throat> or a series of emails, you're increasing that number of touches. So this is an example from one of our clients in Seattle. When he gets an inquiry, an email goes out saying thank you. and Here's my contact information. <clears throat> Let me know if you have any questions. Then the next day, an email goes out saying, here's some new home design ideas. He works with a lot with uh, um, cottage, uh, new cottages or cottage uh, renovations in Seattle. And here's some gallery of images. So he's not saying, hire me. He's just saying, here's some ideas. I thought you might be interested. And then another one. And maybe two weeks later, another one going out saying, here's a video of a home being constructed. You think some people who are thinking about, God, I don't know how this whole thing is going to go, or God, I, would, I hope we can make this project work. They'd be interested in that. So just a series of, of contacts that are sent out automatically. So again, this is online, but it could be done by mail. And in fact, having a newsletter that goes out once a month or on some basis can be very useful. One of our other clients, um, Peter Tui, is an architect in Baltimore. He sends out a single picture every month by email of a project with a brief description and a link to the website. Now, he's not saying a whole lot, but they're beautiful images. And he's gotten not only lots of business from that, he's gotten published many times. Why? Because he includes some of those connectors, the people like who are writers of architectural columns in the newspaper, or publishers or editors of architectural magazines. And when they have a space coming up, hmm, see, we don't have something for the July issue. Let's contact that Peter Tui guy. He's always sending us some stuff. So how do you stay in front of them, building that trust there? Um, and we're going to have a little demonstration. I guess, Enoch, you're going to um, talk about uh, the automated follow-up system. So this is, uh, again, another way that this can be set up. Uh, who's familiar with the Can Spam Act? Anyone? OK, right. So it's just sort of common sense that you shouldn't be sending unsolicited communications to people, right? especially via email. So actually, you can get in legal trouble by just blasting a bunch of people with email. And so what we're talking about here is permission-based marketing. So we get people to raise their hands and say, yes, I enjoy the information you send me. Please continue to send it. So that's some, something important I just want to point out, especially for those of you here in Canada. And yes, we don't care. Just spam everyone down there. <laughs> <laughs>
Not in Canada, though. I'm joking. Okay, so um, which is one reason why the offline strategy is so much more uh, effective, like the gentleman pointed out back here was asking about. So this is, uh, we're going to take a little peek inside one of these automated CRM systems. I don't know how many of you are familiar with marketing automation. Has anyone heard of that term before, marketing automation? Sort of not very widespread in the architecture industry, but I'm glad you've heard about it. Um, CRM, Customer Relationship Management. Sorry, so yeah, the acronym. how do you keep in touch or know when was the last time you talked to someone or what questions they've asked? Oh, yeah, thanks. I was using the acronym. Uh, does anyone have a CRM that they're currently using in their firm? Uh, CRMs include like Salesforce, um, email, email would be sort of MailChimp kind of style. Um, so it's basically a contact database that allows you to keep track of every communication you've had with your clients, past clients, referral partners, etc., and allows you to do some automated stuff. So it's just a, a more centralized location for your database. After all, we're talking about systems here. So this is an example of our uh, email follow-up system that we use. And uh, this is the dashboard. So as you can see in here, it sort of gives you a quick overview of the contacts. In this case, there are zero contacts. Um, and then I want to show you behind the scenes what happens when someone submits that form on a website. So in this case, it kicks off what we call an automation. And this is where the, where the term marketing automation comes into it. We're able to set up this timeline. So this is a timeline view, and I'll zoom out here a little bit. You can see here at the top is the start of the timeline, and then it progresses down. These are just automated things that happen. It could be anything. So it could be, um, you know, send you an email. So you get a notification email that someone requested something. Uh, an automated email could be sent out. In this case, uh, a package could be sent out. You could schedule a phone call, which is always an awesome way to follow up with people. Uh, hey, did you get the, the thing you requested? And so that's why we call it marketing automation. Very, very slick and, and fun the way this works and starts to systematize that process of follow-up. Uh, like Eric said, you know, when you start following up three, four, five, six times, that's when you start closing those projects. Uh, a lot of you probably are in the formal RFP process, right? How many of you have to do th go through that whole dog and pony show, right? Um, as a naive young architect, I used to think it really mattered what you put in the proposal. It does to a certain degree. That gets you on the short list. But in terms of getting chosen, uh, what I see and how many of you who are, excuse me, are much more experienced than I am know that it's all about the relationships. It's about <laughs> the people who get chosen aren't necessarily the best firms. They're people that maybe have some past history, know a couple of people that are in the selection committee, etc. So how are those relationships formed? Well, that's, that's what we're talking about here is forming those relationships. So in terms of the automated, this is just an example of what like the initial email might look like that goes out that delivers that report. You know, basically says, Here, here's the guide that you requested. So the fifth game changer, which we talked about a little bit, would be the monthly newsletter, which is that constant communication that provides useful, uh, relevant content. Uh, you know, before this used to be a lot more expensive to do, but nowadays with some of the tools we have, it's definitely within the reach. You can just save a lot of overhead. So I, I mentioned uh, one of our clients who just sends out a newsletter that is just an image with a couple of sentences about the project and a link to, let's say, the page on his website or the page on his Facebook um, uh, you know, page or business uh, area or on House. Uh, how many of you use House? Okay, so if you're a residential architect, it's a great place to uh, get in front of uh, clients and you can have some, some, something like a parallel version of your website with just project information as well as what they call idea books. So, so images not just of your projects but of cool kitchens or uh, you know other features that uh, people might say, oh, that, that looks like a really interesting thing to do. Now in a newsletter, if you do have a formal one, uh, you of course you're going to have some type of masthead branding that just says this is from a particular firm. Well, look at some of the features that could be included in a newsletter. In addition to just, hey, we just completed a project um, or we've been awarded something, you can have the monkey's fist, the offer for information, which, of course, could be not just one thing that you is the only thing you offer, uh, like this, this uh, your thing about getting a permit. You know, I suggest that you think about what else people need and broaden that. Uh, feature article can be about anything, whether it's about your work or about an industry tr trend or something about the energy requirements that are coming in, 
uh, things like that. A quote can be good because if you have a quote, it could be about your firm or it could be a quote from your principal that's talking about something that's in the industry. So uh, it establishes authority one way or the other. Um, having an interview could be a, a good thing to put into a um, you know, publication. Um, you know, Enoch is interviewing architects all the time. That's information. Architects who are interviewed by someone like Enoch or, or anyone um, can be perceived in a position of authority. If you think about being a guest on a talk show, does it make that person seem like they're important? And what about the host on the talk show? Does Oprah seem like she's somehow very special because she gets these great guests on there? Um, and here's an, an offer, an interesting term, offer. I know we all offer our services, but do you offer something very specific about we can have a consultation about you know, a certain specific uh, part of the process? And that's we're going to be talking about that shortly, is how can you offer something that's not just free or hire us, but something in between? So key point here is if you're sending the newsletter to the right people, and I mentioned Peter Tui and the idea that he sent it to not only past clients, and potential clients, people who he's met at, let's say, the home show, but also to the writers and the publishers or editors of architectural magazines or architectural parts of a newspaper. Um, that's actually getting him a lot of exposure. And sending it regularly every month is pretty good. Entertaining information doesn't have to be pure, dry information about um, you know technical things in, in the business. With key messages embedded, you know, like here's a monkey's fist, here's a quote, uh, and Ultimately, it doesn't have to be all online. In fact, sending physical copies to, let's say, it could be 30 uh, sources, 30 um, uh, of your top potential referral sources, people who are actually in front of your potential clients. Um, that can work even better. Because think about a physical newsletter. I mean, you might just put it into the round bin, right? But if it's interesting, it may sit on your desk for a while. It may be something that you know you file into the bookshelf. And so then if someone says, you know, I'd like to find an architect, do you know any good ones? Well, oh yeah, I have this, I have some newsletters from this architect who is always sending me stuff. Here, make it easy to get a referral. Um, so we've talked about the education and follow-up system. The 10-day appointment system we didn't talk about by name, but it was basically that series of emails or series of contacts that's scripted and planned that gets the low-hanging fruit, the people who are already, you know, sort of ready to talk to someone, and you give them a few bits of information, and they go, you know what, I want to talk to this firm. Circle of love, staying in touch with newsletters, etc. A win-back email campaign is another type of scripting where someone hasn't been in touch with you for a while. You think that they're pretty much gone. They went with someone else. But actually, you know what, a lot of those people who called you about something didn't actually proceed are still thinking about their project. And if you actually send them an email saying, are you still thinking about that renovation project, you'll get some of them saying, you know what? We are. And uh, the autoresponder integration, that's getting the emails sent out regularly. And uh, something that, again, w w mentioned earlier, the shock and awe box, is a way of sending out your marketing materials, your brochure, uh, information and education, monkey's fist, in physical form in a way that feels like a gift. And we don't have time to go into how you do that, but it's a pretty cool thing to get something where it's embedding a message that you're a very helpful resource in a way that they go, oh, how nice of you to send this. So it's a pretty interesting way to do that. All right, so the value of a pre-built follow-up system. Let's have a little quiz. You'll drop the ball without it. A. B. 81% of deals close after the fifth contact. C, to position you as the expert or educator. D, effortless, it works while you sleep. E, you seem to make more money when you don't squander opportunities. Or F, all of the above. Any volunteers here? All right. All of the above. OK. So this last section, any takeaways? Anything that you feel like, I want to try that? Come on, raise your hand, somebody. You're all so polite here in Canada. Anything that you think you can actually use from what we did. So now we're going to talk about this missing step that we talked about. Before I do that, though, let's just have everyone, if you like, stand up for a second. Take a, we're going to take a 20-second break. One of the best-paid marketers of all time, Gary Halbert, said, an uncertain prospect never buys. So what we're going to talk about right now is what generally keeps um, clients from moving ahead and how we can help them along that process. 
Now I want you to imagine for a second just a, a pair of stairs with the first two steps missing. Imagine, close your eyes, imagine just trying to put your leg up onto that first step there. Don't pull anything. Come back to that example in a second. So what is it exactly that stops clients or prospective clients from moving forward? Uh, what we found is that generally people are more afraid of making a mistake than, than getting a reward. Uh, you know, a lot of times people will do things just to cover their backside rather than try to do something really cool. So we see that a lot working with clients. They're more, more concerned about the liability and the risk, especially the fear of embarrassment or making a mistake. The second thing would be a lack of clarity about the process or outcome. If someone doesn't understand the steps you're going to take them through, they don't know what they're signing up for. And they might not verbalize that, but unless you clearly lay out the process, they're going to be hesitant to move forward. The third thing would be fear of not feeling in control. So when clients feel or prospective clients feel they don't have a choice, they don't have any options, they're not in the driver's seat, that as well will keep them from moving ahead. They'll procrastinate. So the procrastination is caused by the uncertainty. And whether they are a very experienced client or someone who hasn't worked with architects in the past, that uncertainty is going to pop up, especially if it's a new relationship, if they haven't ever worked with you before. So what's the solution to that? So what we do here is we create some small steps and we explain the process. Most architects, my mentors, when I was trained, everyone that I've ever worked with, this is the architectural sales process for them. Basically, it goes from unknown to known to boom, contract for architectural services. So we're asking our clients to take this enormous leap from the ground plane up here to spending a you know, design fee of $10,000, $50,000, half a million dollars. Right? So that's a big, big jump. question is, how can we make that process a little smoother? How can we fill in some of those steps? So we're going to show you a couple of examples about how this can be done, but it's important that we don't fill this in with free steps. Okay, so not, not a free solution. We're going to show you how to get paid for things that you probably do for free. So if you implement this, uh, I'm pretty confident that you could uh, increase your yearly revenues by 5 to 10%. Anyone interested in increasing their yearly revenues by 5% at the minimum? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, all right. Uh, we know this works because we've done it with architects and they've had exactly those results. So we call this the low commitment consultation. Uh, basically, have a think for a second. Do you offer any low price services besides your design contracts? So you probably do, right? You probably have some sort of, you probably have programming studies. You might have feasibility studies. You might have code reviews. The question is, do you ever offer those up front and actively uh, tell your clients about those, actively help them do that. Hopefully you do, right? That's a great way to get your foot in the door. Uh, here's an example. When we first introduced this concept, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what goes into this, uh, architect Gayla Bechtel was very hesitant because we told her, look, she was doing the typical free consultation, right? Come in for my office, pick my brain for an hour, I'm going to give you some design sketches to prove how good I am, and then I'm going to hope that you call me back. That was her sales process. Right? That's most architect sales process, uh, who, especially in the residential sector. And um, so she was really hesitant. We said, look, you've got to stop doing that. You've got to charge for that meeting. You have to charge for it. Number one, that's going to qualify your clients. It's going to get rid of all the tower kickers. Number two, it's going to make you a little bit of money. But more important than that, number three, it's going to set the stage and the expectation for the future that you don't give out a lot of free work. Because she had the problem where she was doing a lot of stuff for free, and she wasn't billing for it. When she tried to bill for it, the client would complain about it. Hey, what's this charge for? So we said, look, you've got to set the expectation up front that your time is valuable. Very, she didn't want to do this. So, she said, so we said, okay, go ahead. Just try this out at your Toastmasters club. We said, just get in front of a group of people and pitch them on this paid consultation. So as opposed to you did it, you did it for free before, pitch them like they're clients, and you're going to pitch them on this paid consultation. So she did it. And this was pretty crazy. Someone from the group who she'd known uh, for two years had been thinking about a product for 10, and she actually landed the paid consultation. <laughs> so she was just practicing that to her Toastmasters group. So I thought that was kind of fun. All right. So how do you do this? Well, there's a specific uh, process to creating one of these low commitment consultations that takes away all the risk, that takes away the insecurity, and helps people move forward. Uh, and the process, there's four steps to it. Number one, it needs to have a name. 
we give it number two a promise, number three a process, and number four a definite price. So just an example from the airline industry so that we can all understand would be business class, right? Uh, if they didn't call it that, then it's just a service. All they do is they kind of, you know, they the promise is you get higher quality, uh, higher quality, well, higher quality experience, more comfortable, bigger seats. The check-in is expedited. You might get a bigger food selection, and the price is often double what someone in economy class would pay. So what they've done here is they've taken a service and turned it into a product. One of the problems with services in general is that the scope can be very ephemeral, very hard to define, very very hard to pin down in the client's mind. So when clients look at services, they don't really they have a hard time understanding what they're getting, right? So by putting a service through this process, we create something that they can easily understand, like first class flying. We all know what that is. So the first step is to give it a name. So what is the name of this initial consultation you're going to give? Is it a, an initial meeting? Uh, one that I like is the needs and options review. You know, come into my office. I'm going to take you through the process of just talking about your needs. What are your needs? What are some potential options? It could be a one-page action plan. You know, definitely charge for the site visit, feasibility study, discovery process. After you have developed this thing, then you need to develop a way for clients to easily take you up on this. This is architect Rachel Burton. She's out of uh, the U.S. down South Carolina. And you can see here, this is her booking form. She's a residential architect, and she has her name on it. Well, the name of the, the service, uh, which is the discovery consultation, it has a promise, what they're going to get, the price, and the process. So now Rachel is charging for what she used to do for free. And she's because of this, she's boosted her revenue. And the interesting thing is, is if you do this properly, clients will choose to pay over something that's free. And that's sort of a little counterintuitive thing that we found, is that actually clients are more hesitant to go into some sort of free thing because they're afraid it's just a sales pitch in disguise. They're afraid that there's going to be strings attached. With this, we say, look, there's no strings attached. Take this, go to any other architect you want, but you're going to get some of your initial questions answered during this, this process. All right. So that's the low commitment consultation. Uh, Rachel, for hers, charges $750. And, you know, it includes some things like basically an interview with the client and doing a little bit of code research. So kind of a feasibility study, something that I know a lot of architects do for free, right? Any questions about this LCC process? Uh, this is truly a game changer and uh, Zeke Freeman who's another architect he sent us an email a while ago who had talked about he said that uh, um, oh a client wrote him an email saying you know what your fee for some reason is double the other architects we've talked to they said but we really like the process that you've taken us through and so we're gonna go ahead and go with you right and he taken them through this process that made them feel comfortable so you know the fee was no longer an issue any questions about the LCC? So this is the missing step that we find a lot of people uh, are missing. If you can find a way to work this into what you're offering your clients, they're going to they're gonna love it. They're going to love you for it. You know, there's probably things they're doing right now that you can help them out with that they don't need to lay out a lot of cash for. And especially, they might not even need to get it approved uh, through the facility because if it's under a certain dollar amount, you know, they can just approve that themselves. Uh, questions or comments? Does this seem interesting? Does this seem like something something new that you haven't done before that you could possibly apply in your practice? And this goes to anything. This name, promise, price, and process should be applied to everything you're offering, not just the LCC. So that's the low commitment consultation. What you'll find is that after someone goes through this process with you, you're going to be able to tell if it's someone you want to work with. That's another benefit. If there's any red flags, getting them on board with one of these small consultations will let you know if, hey, I think this isn't going to work out. You know, it's kind of a way to date them. Questions? Yes, sir. Thanks for sharing that, Greg. That's a very advanced technique. And just to mention that, what he said was when a client comes to you and said, hey, can you reduce the fee, this allows you to say, I can't reduce the fee, but what I can do is I can, I can knock out the feasibility, and that'll drop the fee by X number of dollars. So instead of, right, instead of, like, changing the fee, what you're doing is you're just removing services, but they're very specific parts of your process. That's a great way to, um, to approach that. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. Okay, I know we're uh, running out of time here, so we're just going to 
go through these last few slides um, very, very quickly. There is a process that we recommend that you'll be able to take control of the in-person meeting and the, the actual phone consultation. Uh, we recommend having a script. How many of you actually have a plan for when someone calls in, what questions to ask them? Okay, script is a funny term, but basically it can be as simple as a series of questions that help you to qualify the client. Do they have a realistic budget? Are they the people who you should be talking to or not? Um, how can you uh, set it up so not only do they think, hey, these are expert uh, ar architects, but also that I really need to know more information here. How can you trigger certain uh, motivations behind the scenes? These are things that you can do in a, a carefully scripted process. Now, we won't have time, obviously, to do a demonstration. We are going to be providing some webinars coming up, um, and we'll, uh, you'll get information when uh, you get that uh, the diagram. Uh, so that'll be something where the, the demonstration of this script by our partner Richard Petrie is awesome because you really can see asking the right questions is very friendly part of the process and yet it puts you in the driver's seat in a very, very interesting way. It's one of the best parts of our presentation. Unfortunately, we can't do it today. Um, having a pre-meeting questionnaire. Think about when you go to a doctor's office and they have the clipboard. You fill in all of those things and then the doctor takes a look at it, it puts a certain psychological context to it. Instead of them asking the doctor question, well, how do you deal with cancer? Or how do you deal with, you know, I have a back problem. How do you? Well, they might ask those questions, but actually the doctor um, is in control there. So as you as architects, how can you set that up? Um, and the face-to-face -face meeting script, again, how can you set up a process that's repeatable, that you're actually uh, getting the, the best possible chance of winning the project? Now, how we operate is another part of this. Letting people know this is the way we do things. We have this meeting here, and then we have a follow-up doing this, and then this happens, and then that happens, actually establishes you in the driver's seat as opposed to them saying, okay, this is how we want to move forward, or don't call us for the next month because we're going to be doing things. I mean, obviously, you have to accommodate their needs, their schedule, but there's something here where you're guiding them carefully. They can feel like there's certainty. You've, you've got a system there. So ultimately, having an incoming call script and a process that you follow or your staff follows to warm them up, take them through a series of steps, can make a big difference in your business. So we've talked a little bit about the low commitment consultation and the incoming phone script or the, the meeting um, process. So why do architects need a low commitment consultation? We're running out of time here because they sound cool to remove the risk for clients so you have all the facts to create a better design because you get paid for what you do, used to do for free. And it qualifies out the tire kickers because offering this is something different than other architects and it differentiates you because you're offering this valuable, small service, low commitment that is actually different. And experts diagnose thoroughly because before they prescribe. Would you ever go to the doctor and say, can you do this operation for me? And the doctor's saying, well, let me examine you. Let me see what you need. All right, so all of the above? OK, all of the above again. All right, so we're running out of time for check-in here. I just want to make sure that we have a quick review of the three systems. And because we have two minutes left, we talk about ways to attract clients, not go and wait for, not wait for their call, but actually attract them, how to um, uh, educate them, which is a series of steps where you're informing them not only about who you are, but about Think issues and questions that they have, um, and ultimately how to guide the process of winning the business. So we've gone through seven game changers. You might want to write these down if you haven't already. The intelligent action. So I hope that you've learned some things here that you're going to act on. The monkey's fist, the educational offer, the report, uh, or other information. Could be video, could be anything that helps them solve some of their questions or problems. The landing page is one way to do this if you want to work online. The automated follow-up where you actually have a system that keeps in touch so that you don't drop the ball. The circle of love, a way of keeping in touch. Newsletters is a, is a typical, easy way to do that. The low commitment consultation, which removes uncertainty and provides a small step like dating before you get into living together or marriage or hiring 
for design services, and the incoming call script, which guides them through the process as opposed to following their process, you are giving them a process to work with. So the fastest way to become an in-demand architect, do you want to go to church more often? Well, maybe. You want to lose weight and date a movie star? Hey, sounds sort of cool. Wait for other architects to praise you. How many of you are waiting for that award or you know the, the uh, recognition? Well, it's good. But if you help a large number of people by offering valuable material to your market and follow up with them until they're ready to actually talk, then you offer a chance to reduce their risk and improve their design with a low commitment consultation. Well, I think that's probably a better strategy than dating a movie star. All right. So where to go from here? Send a text message here. We'll stay in touch with you. We'll send you some information. We'll send you that diagram. We'll send you this report. And we will be having a series of webinars that will go actually deeper um, into these areas. And that call script, I can tell you, people have said that that particular part of the webinar just opened their eyes to the process. Instead of just sort of call comes in, doing whatever happens, that call script can make a huge difference there. So, Enoch, let's finish up. Great. Uh, we're going to be hanging out for a little bit if you have any questions. Uh, any questions that you want to you ask about the presentation? What did everyone think about it? Thought it was wonderful, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. And that is the end of today's episode. For those of you who want to get the marketing flowchart that we talked about during this presentation, that phone number is 415 415- Five two eight seven four zero three. So go ahead and write that down. Four one five five two eight seven four zero three. Give that a try. Let me know if you get the uh, that marketing flowchart. Uh, go ahead and text architect to that number. So text architect to four one five five two eight seven four zero three. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. If you enjoyed today's show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. There are two reasons to do this. First, it encourages me to continue making free content for you to run a fulfilling and profitable practice. And secondly, it allows others to find this content inside of iTunes so that they can benefit as well. For free resources for running an architecture practice that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the join button to unlock your account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, boost profitability, start a firm, and much more. Until next week, this has been the Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, do it anyway.